You please kneel for your prayer for vocations. Let us ask God to give worthy priests, brothers, and sisters to his holy church. O God, we earnestly beseech thee to bless this diocese with many priests, brothers, and sisters who will love thee with their whole strength and gladly spend their entire lives to serve thy church and to make thee known and loved. Bless our families, bless our children. Mary, Queen of the Clergy, many more. Please be seated. St. Mary's will host an autumn meeting of the Vicariate Council of Catholic Women on October 5th. The registration form and information will be in the bulletin today. If you can help out, please make sure to contact others and call Laura Petranik Arneson. Don't forget the trivia night where all the fun begins, so it says. Next Saturday, September 28th, in the school at 5.30. There's a flyer in the bulletin. Please check your bulletin for everything that's going on. Uh, if you have any objects to be blessed, please bring them back immediately after Mass to the sacristy in the back, and I will bless them for you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. As I watch things unfolding in the Church these days, I am more and more convinced that we need a deeper, ongoing catechesis, especially among those who prefer the traditional form of the Roman Rite, and in two areas, liturgical and eschatological. Eschatology has to do with the study of the last things and the end days. In fact, these two different things, liturgy and eschatology, are deeply connected to each other. Now, I think in your catechism you all learned what the ends, the four ends of Holy Mass are. You could probably recite them. Petition, adoration, atonement, and thanksgiving. These are four reasons to go to Mass, to participate fully, actively, consciously. Well, there's another point, or another end of Mass, which is an overarching end, and that is preparation for death. The fact is, we are all going to die, some of us, sooner rather than later. And so this overarching reason why we go to Mass, the reason that gives substance to why we come to Mass to praise, to thank, to express sorrow for sin, to offer our requests, is the fact of our impending death, from which we must not allow ourselves ever to be distracted. It seems to me that in a lot of places, many liturgical antics and bad choices are, on the surface, made in the name of participation of the community, or they're made in the name of being happy, or mutual affirmation, or daisies, or kitties, or whatever. But then they'll sprinkle through those every once in a while, these ends of the Mass, the classic ends. But underneath, what they wind up being are distractions from the mystery that, even though Christ died and overcame death once and for all time, we still have to die in order to be brought to the perfection we were made for with God in heaven. So this is why you see sometimes in some modern church settings the crucifix off to a side or in some in some places you don't even see a crucifix, you just see a cross, not an image of our Lord dead on the cross. You don't want that. It might be an unhappy thought. So they put these things off to the side or they obscure the fact of the mystery of the death of the Lord for our salvation. Now an advantage to ad orient, orientum worship, which we have here in the traditional form, and in some places, a growing number of places in the Novus Ordo, is that it places the crucified Lord at the focal point for both the priest and you in the pews. Benedict XVI said 
that if going entirely ad orientum for your worship wasn't feasible, then what should they should do is they should place the crucifix on the altar so that the crucified Lord is before the eyes of the priest, keeping it front and center for the one who is the paternal mediator when he is turned toward God ad orientem and the fraternal mediator when he then turns back to the congregation. There's this dynamic back and forth. Augustine of Hippo once said, I am a bishop for you, but I am a Christian with you. There's a fraternal relationship and there's a paternal relationship that's expressed in these different ways of facing forward and back, back. Forward, I mean toward the altar, and then back towards you. Not back, my back towards you, but looking back towards you. So keeping the cross and the crucified Lord in the center brings our attention to the mystery of his saving work and the reality of his death and our death, his resurrection after death and our resurrection after death. And death is the key to reading a lot of the things that we do in church. Now a lot of the music and the liturgical choices that are made in many places are, I think, subconsciously, I don't think they're necessarily doing this consciously, but subconsciously, they employ these things to distract us from the chilling prospect of what we have to do to live the Christian life. And that is repent, and do penance, and make changes because we're going to die. Confess our sins because we are going to go before our judge. And that's a chilling prospect for a lot of people today. It's, well, it's always been a chilling prospect. Augustine, the same Augustine I quoted earlier, once described death as the hiems quotidiana, the, the daily winter. That when we think of it, even in the midst of a hot North African summer, it gives us a chill. There are so many distractions in our lives. So many things that distract us from thinking about the things that are very important. And some of those distractions take us away from a healthy, continuous reflection on death, for which this life is a preparation. This isn't the end. The poet said, life is real, life is earnest. The grave is not the goal, but we do have to pass through the grave. Now, some people react very sharply uh, to the traditional form of the Roman rite because they aren't, they aren't used to things not being immediately seeable or hearable or, or understandable or comprehensible. They're used to having everything spoon-fed in an easy way and then they encounter this difficult thing where they have to be still and quiet and listen and engage their wills in a way that they maybe have never done so in a liturgical setting so that they can receive what's coming in. They're not used to these things. Everything is like feeding one of your, one of your many children here, right? Here comes the choo-choo, right? It can become very, very easy and spoon-fed. But what we're doing here is hard. There's nothing easy about what happens at Holy Mass, the nexus of the transcendent and our earthly existence. They have a hard time sometimes, people, when encountering the traditional Mass for the first time, because they can't see things that Father is doing. They can't hear what he's doing. And they think that they have to hear everything, even though Father isn't talking to them. Father happens to be talking to God at the moment. But, oh, no, we have to see everything. You know, we're living in a world today where, in watching a baseball game, they can, you can slow things down to the point where you can see the stitches on the ball as it spins toward the plate. Well, this, in a certain sense, takes a lot of the wonder and the mystery out of things. Everything is immediately apprehended, immediately grasped, then it's difficult to have an encounter with mystery. This is one of the reasons why the genius of every Catholic rite deprives 
us of our senses at some point. In a lot of Eastern liturgy, you're behind doors, a screen, you can't see it, but everything is sung. In the Roman Rite, you can see things, but very often you can't hear things. There's a deprivation of the senses, which makes you to be still, waiting, reaching out with heart and mind in a deeply active participation. Deeper by far than if everything is constantly being pushed at you and you don't have to work for it. So moving to another point. To those to whom more is given, more is going to be expected. Now we have been given a precious gift in our liturgical rites and we have to make the very best use of it that we can. We will have to deepen our knowledge of the faith and its liturgical aspects because liturgy is doctrine. You see how very weak sometimes doctrine can be in places where there is all sorts of liturgical experimentation, where nothing is, where, the, where ritual is diminished, where it's constant change, constant innovation, constant creativity. There's no liturgical, there's no, no liturgical space for doctrine in a lot of ways. Those two collide with each other, the innovation and creativity and the stability of doctrine and its relation to you through the texts and the gestures of Holy Mass. Liturgy is doctrine, but also it is a privileged locus place for the contemplation of the four last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. That's the overarching reason, by the way, why we're here this morning. Now, it's possible that in a contemplation of the four last things, at a certain point we have to always consider the end times, which may be in our lifetime. I stand up in here and say, you're all going to die. I'm going to die. You're going to die. Well, it might happen that the Lord returns and that some Christians on this, the face of this earth will not die, but they will go through the entire tribulation and come to the end time that way, never having passed through the door of death that we otherwise do. Well, we're going to leave that timetable to the Lord. In the second chapter of the second letter to the Thessalonians, Paul says, well, you don't know when this is going to happen, so you can't live as, we're, as if we're in the end times. We have to live as if we're in the long haul. But nevertheless, we can keep our eyes on the signs of the times. So we have to have a deeper reflection on the four last things constantly, but also in conjunction with the deeper liturgical catechesis for the primary reason that we are our rites. They shape us, and over centuries we shape them. They shape us in the sense that we take nourishment, we take food into our bodies, and then we change that, we, our bodies change that into, into what we are, bone and blood and flesh and so forth. Well, in this privileged place that we are in, this holy place, we are able to receive the nourishment which changes us into what it is. The body and the blood of the Lord which we receive transforms us. And so we have to be ready to receive well everything that the Lord wants to give us in every word, in every gesture, and especially in his body and blood. So the last time I was here with you, we talked about some dimen dimensions of the, or the offertory prayers for the rites for the traditional rite of mass, how the priest hear well, how this priest hears them at least, and internalizes them. And a key element of those prayers, and something that forms a priest over many years of saying this form of mass, is the fact of his unworthiness to be up here. The awesome task to which he is called to perform as another Christ, as being Christ's own person at the altar, acting in his person both the one offering and the one being offered. The priest is both priest and victim at the offer, at the, at the altar. So I did that last time, and I'm going to continue to do these things because 
of the research that shows that 7 out of 10 Catholics don't know or believe what the Church teaches about transubstantiation in the real presence. We need a liturgical catechesis. Now I know that you are not in that negative statistic. Nevertheless, you have a responsibility as members of the Church also to participate in the mission that Christ gave the Church to go forth and teach people, to teach all nations. You are not exempt from that. That's not the, that's not the sole job of the priest or of the bishop. Lay people share in this mission too. I can't reach all the people that you know but you can reach all the people that you know. And so you have to bring this to them. And we all know people who have fallen away from the church, who are struggling about the church, who are interested in the church. And I have for years, by the way, been suggesting to you to be inviting to get them in here. Because when you love, you want to share what you love. So today, let's talk about the twofold consecration especially and especially one particular aspect of the consecration of the precious blood. The rite of consecration is the central mystery of the sacrifice of the Mass. Christ renews his sacrifice on the cross on our altars when we do as he commanded in his memory. That doing isn't just play acting or a simple imitation. It is Christ in the person of the priest renewing his self-offering to the Father, but in an unbloody, in a sacramental way. By God's power, it is a remembering that makes real, truly and sacramentally present, the mystery that we celebrate. And remember, the sacramental reality is not less real than the things that we can smell or taste or feel or hear or touch. Sacramental reality is just as real. So the death of the Lord is renewed and revealed in the separation of Christ's blood from his body. That's why we have a twofold consecration. First the body, and then the blood, apart, not with, but apart from the body. It symbolizes the separation of those two, and therefore it's the, the death of the Lord. Now it's true that in every host and in every drop of the precious blood, the whole Christ is present, body, blood, soul, and divinity. But the sacramental liturgical act symbolically separates the two. Now the Lord continues his self-offering in heaven, outside of time and space, as high priest. And that's why we, participating here in Christ's priesthood, can offer that same self-offering anywhere and everywhere. If we had priests at the side altar saying Mass right now at the same time as I was saying, saying Mass up here is no problem. When Holy Communion is distributed, Christ is in this host, this host, this host, the two priests on either side, still in the tabernacle. Christ, it's possible for this because of the, the ascension of the Lord. He's moved outside time and space. He's not limited in that way. It's not, it, when we renew these things, we're not trying to renew a historical thing. It's a sacramental renewal of the reality of Calvary. So in the two-fold consecration, the body and the blood separate. And then later in Mass, the priest recombines these two when he places a small piece of the host into the chalice of the precious blood. Places the, places the pall on top as if he's covering the tomb and we're waiting for the resurrection to take place. And in the middle of the consecration formula for the precious blood, the priest says, Mysterium Fidei, the mystery of faith. He says this quietly. You don't, you don't hear this part. There are different levels of voice that the priest is supposed to use, sometimes so quietly that only he can hear it sometimes just loudly enough so that the servers who have to respond can hear it, sometimes so that everybody can hear it. This is one of the, the, the mysterious points where you are, you are being deprived in your senses of something so that you have, to more, you have to reach out more earnestly with your heart and mind, offering, uniting your sacrifice to what's happening. 
up at the altar. Now, one of the most startling things that happened that was done in the name of the council was to pull Mysterium Fidei out of the form of consecration of the precious blood and shift it to after the elevation and to use it as the something to invoke a response. For many centuries, Mysterium Fidei had been embedded in the form of consecration of the precious blood, at least going back to sacramentaries that we have from the 8th century. But suddenly we pulled this thing out and put it outside of that, extracted that Mysterium Fidei and put it outside. Now there are a lot of people in the traditional side of things that thought that that would in some way invalidate the consecration, invalidate the form of consecration of the precious blood and therefore the Novus Ordo, as they claimed, was invalid. And that's false does not invalidate the consecration. But it does shift the emphasis in a way that's rather startling. And it was certainly an innovation that was not called for. The, the, the fathers of the Second Vatican Council said that there should be no innovation in the liturgy which did not flow, number one, from the previous forms, and number two, was not truly for the good of the people. And there's no way that this particular change was either of those. But they did a lot of things in the name of the Council that were not mandated by the Council Fathers. I digress. So they extracted that phrase, Mysterium Fidei, and they made, out of, made it a kind of an acclamation uh, to which the congregations are supposed to respond, not with one possible response, but with this one or that one or the other thing. So what does it mean? What does Mysterium Fidei mean? Well, let's take a look at that for a moment. It probably comes from the first letter of Timothy, in chapter 3, where he's talking about those who are actually deacons who have to hold fast to the mystery of faith with a clear conscience. They have to adhere fast, strongly, firmly, to belief in the Eucharist, now, in the early church, deacons were especially attached to ministry having to do with the precious blood. Which is why, during solemn masses, sometimes you'll see during the offertory, the, the deacon will prepare the chalice, the deacon prepares the chalice, and then he kisses it and he hands it to the priest, and he holds on to the chalice while the priest and the deacons say the prayer together. There's a connection between deacons and the ministry of the precious blood. And so they would pray this, that, that offertory prayer together. And so the Mysterium Fidei was, in very ancient times, probably the exclamation that the deacons made at, during the silent consecration when curtains were drawn before the sanctuary. You have to picture an ancient church. They would have a kind of a screen, like very much like our Eastern brothers and sisters have. And then they would draw curtains, and you would not be able to see or hear a great deal, but at a certain point there would be an exclamation about Mysterium Fidei, meaning that the consecration has taken place. Transubstantiation, as it would come to be called, has taken place. And this idea of the curtains and, and so forth. Uh, there, in the ancient church, remember that they would, the catechumens and so forth would have to leave the church after the explication of the Word of God, they would have to leave. And then they would only be admitted after they were baptized. And it was after that process of baptism that they would be enabled with supernatural faith to receive explanations of the things that happened in the liturgy. It's called mystagogical catechesis. And this was the process for centuries. The, under, the idea being that, that if you didn't have that supernatural faith given to you through the sacraments, you wouldn't be able to grasp the mystery in hearing in all words and the gestures. 
The baptism enables you to understand things in a way that you can't if you're not baptized. The old phrase of Augustine is, Nisi credideritis non intelligetis. Unless you will have first believed, you will not understand. Belief leads to a different kind of understanding. And the deepening of supernatural faith given to us in baptism allows us to apprehend aspects of the mystery which otherwise we can't grasp. Which is why they engaged in this kind of catechesis that I'm doing with the new with new Christians after their baptism. But we have dropped the ball on this for a long time and we need this deeper liturgical catechesis. It's all part of your ability to participate fully consciously actually actively in everything that we do here. So what happens is that the mystery of faith is connected specifically to the change, substantial change, of the body of the, of the bread into the body of the Lord and the wine into the blood of the Lord. This is the supreme moment during Mass with the consecration of the precious blood when we are truly by the cross with Mary and with John. This is the highest moment of the life of Christ and the life of the church, the death of the Lord, the separation of the two, the saving work being completed. It's consummated, he said, in nuptial imagery. And after that, the side of the Lord was pierced and blood and water flowed forth, the saving Eucharist and the cleansing sacrament of baptism. We need a, urgently I think, we need a deeper liturgical catechesis. Look, I cannot say everything that there is to be said about the Mysterium Fidei, but at least I have said something. And you can on your own find magnificent resources to help you understand these beautiful elements of Mass which over centuries, millennia actually, have been explained by writers with spiritual depth that I cannot possibly even imagine. I can help you towards these things. But you have to do some of this work on your own. I can't be up here, for example, no priest can be up here in a pulpit and constantly be, you know, here comes the choo-choo. I can't spoon feed things. You have to now as you as you deepen in your grasping, if you deepen in your understanding what's happening in the liturgical action and your role in it, then after a while, instead of being given easy things, then you're able to chew and take more complicated things and do the work yourselves. Maturing in the faith and maturing in your liturgical participation this is a goal that we have to have. We need a deeper liturgical catechesis tied also with our reflection of the four last things. Because the overarching reason, along with prayer and petition and so forth, the overarching reason why we come to Holy Mass is because one day we will go before the judge. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.